All right, well, good morning. If you got your Bibles, we're going to be in John 2. That's our main verse for this morning as we get there. But before we get there, we have just finished up our five-week series on the war for our world about the, the spiritual battle between um, God seeking peace and nudity and and abundance in our world and Satan trying to destroy all that God has done. And as we read in John 10, that he, came, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So we have that. We've just finished that up. And believe it or not, we are moving in next week to Palm Sunday and Easter. So we're kind of in that in-between Sunday. And uh, we are talking about Jesus this morning as he comes into Jerusalem, into the Passover in John 2. And as Tara shared in uh, this morning uh, in the other Gospels about going to the temple and the cleansing of the temple. And uh, Jesus is bringing in peace and restoration. But I want us to remember that we often, at least in our society and, and in today's modern age, we really haven't had a war here in the United States for a long time, right? I mean, we hear about wars in other countries and the war going on in Israel right now, but we haven't had a war in the United States. And my question is this, why do we have wars? Just because we like to fight? Hopefully not. Why do we have wars? Well, typically we have war, at least from my opinion and my point of view this morning, we have a war in order to protect something, right? You have an invader coming in, trying to take what is unlawfully theirs, trying to capture that or enslave that, and then you have the people defending themselves in war to protect what they have. In other words, we talk about peace and freedom, and we celebrate the, the freedom that we have in the United States. We celebrate that we have rights, and we have the ability to meet in church on Sunday, on and Mondays, and Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and Fridays, and Saturdays on a regular basis without condemnation. And that's peace, and that's freedom. But we need to remember that peace and freedom came at a cost, didn't it? Somewhere in our history in the recent past, our peace and freedom were challenged by those who wanted to overtake our country and, and usher in us to be enslaved or have them in power in some way. And our country defended itself somewhere in the world. We look back in the Civil War and there was a war between the North and the South, between black and white to unify the country. Some didn't want it unified. Others did, and there was a war to unify the country, irrelevant of whether you're from the North or South, or you're black or you're white. And the North won, and there was freedom for all. We saw in World War I and World War II that there was warring nations trying to overtake the freedom of others, and the United States got involved and fought for that freedom. We see in John chapter 2, and in the verse of the terror read in, in the other Gospels, that there, is, there was a war for freedom in the New Testament with Jesus. He was trying to usher in peace, right? Peace and love and unity. But to do that, he had to invade the religious system, the traditions that we talked about the last five weeks. He had to invade that and state that that was wrong in order to bring freedom in. In other words, Jesus had to go to war to fight that which was wrong, which was evil, which had twisted what God intended it to be, to overcome that, to bring forth freedom. His fight was simply against a dead religion. And we still have that war going on today where people get caught up in religion and earning your way to heaven and, and struggling with guilt and shame and being controlled by fear as we looked at the last couple of weeks. But Jesus comes in and he fights for the freedom and the fulfillment of what God had planned. And that's what we're looking at today. So today, we are not looking at Jesus, meek, and mild. Not today. Sorry, kids. Today, we are looking at Jesus, the disruptor. Now, when you think of Jesus, how often do you think of him as a disruptor? Someone who comes in and really stirs the pot and, and, and challenges things. Well, we, when we look at Jesus, it's funny that we always think of him, you know, nice and meek and mild and have a little picture with the little lamb and everything on him and, you know, the children coming on, onto him. But when you read through the New Testament, you see Jesus disrupting both religion and people's lives on a regular basis, don't we? 
I mean, he was constantly challenging the status quo and challenging people's lives and challenging the, the, the religious people of the time. And what we see in here in, in John 2 is that Jesus the disruptor comes into Jerusalem right before the Passover. He makes a whip out of some cords and he literally drives the animals out and he overturns the tables that are selling the animals for the sacrifice and he takes the, 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 the merchant's money and he literally dumps the money upside down. And that's where we see the, the impact of the story. Because think of this, think if, if you went to a farmer's market, let's say, right? And you walked up to the farmer's market and you wiped everything off of their table, and you <coughs> threw their tables upside down, and you grabbed their cash register, and you threw it all over the grass. Do you think they would welcome you? That's the image here. I mean, it's not just the fact that he's letting the animals free. It's not just the fact that he's overturning the tables. He's literally taking their money bags and he's dumping them out all over. This gets extremely personal for the people that are there. Now, I want you to keep that in mind as Jesus is fighting against this dead religion and this exchange of money that's going on in his temple, because we're also going to look at another aspect of Jesus the disruptor in the fact that sometimes you and I get, oh, how should we say it? A little complacent, a little lazy, a little backslidden. And that's where Jesus the disruptor intervenes in our life. Sometimes we need a little push, a little shove. Sometimes we need something to stir up in our life to make us wonder and question so that we seek God more. Because God is trying to bring forth this peace and this hope and this abundance in our life, just like he was in the sanctuary, the house of his father, the synagogue, but when it's been profaned, he comes in to disrupt it. So, I want to read you a list of products. We'll have a little fun this morning. It's Interactive Church this morning. If you're online, play along, right? So I want to read you a list of products, and as I read them, I want you to think about what they all have in common, okay? Ken's laughing already, okay? The synapses are going, the brain's moving, right? We're awake. Yeah, everyone's had their coffee. So I'll read you these things, and then at the end of them, you tell me what they all have in common. It'd be interesting to hear the answers. So here we go. You ready? You ready, Tara? Okay. Pagers. Cassette players. Rotary phones. Public telephone booths. Dial-up internet. Telegraph machines. Horse-drawn carriages. Hand-operated egg beaters and hand-cranked pencil sharpeners. What do they all have in common? Tara's going, you had me on the phone thing until you hit like egg beaters, then you lost me, right? People use them for something, good answer. How often do you use those things today? Nope, nope. they're obsolete, right? They all served a purpose at one time in history they were all great, you know, they probably had them on the, the Ronco TV shows, you know, buy two, get one free kind of thing or whatever with your free set of Ginsu knives. They all served a purpose at one time, and they were all thought to be fantastic at one time. But then, they were surpassed by something better, and they've become obsolete. Something new, something more advanced, and we as people embraced the new and got rid of the old, right? In other words, there was a disruption in the market to bring in something bigger and better. Now, I, I was writing this message and I thought about this for a minute because I, you know, I initially said cassette players are kind of out of fashion and out of vogue. We don't have cassette players anymore, but then I saw a commercial where they're selling cassette players become, because they're coming back into fashion because they are retro, right? But realistically, we don't sell cassette players anymore because they were replaced by CDs, right? And then the CDs were replaced by iPods. And then iPods re were replaced by your phone because now you can stream music and videos on your phone, right? You don't need to carry some big, remember in the 80s, the big boom boxes when you were cool? The big hair, the big boom boxes, and you know, the car and everything, that was all cool. You don't see that anymore. What you see is someone walking around with their phone in their pocket on their side, their little stretchy pants and their phone in their pocket. They've got the little things in their ears and they're just jamming out like this, you know? Put today back like 20, 30 years ago. 
Because today people walk and they have their, their earphones in or whatever and they're talking. And back in the 80s, people would have thought they were absolutely crazy, right? Someone's just walking down the street with someone something in the air and they're just talking out loud. Well, today we know what? They're on their phone having a conversation. But isn't it weird just to see someone walking down just kind of randomly talking in the middle of nowhere to no one and no one's around? That's where we've come. We've replaced that. In essence, what Jesus was doing in these Gospels that we're going to look at, he was having a disruption in the religious society. He was having a disruption in the lives of his people because the old covenant was now obsolete. The new covenant was replacing it, and it was bigger and better and more applicable. And the goal was to have people embrace the new covenant to get rid of the old covenant. Now, from our point of view in history, that sounds pretty easy, right? But again, put yourself back in the place of the disciples, of the religious leaders of the time, of Jesus walking around in this time. What had those people known all their life? The old covenant, religion, right? Tradition that had been ingrained in their hearts and their minds for years, for decades, for generations. This is what you do. Thus saith the Lord. This is how you do it. And the people didn't question it. As we looked at the last five weeks, they had developed a bunch of laws, 600 plus laws that were to protect and guard the Ten Commandments. And you had to keep all those religious laws. You had to sacrifice in certain ways. And if you didn't do certain things or you, you touched a dead body or something, you were unclean and you couldn't worship. And these people had lived their entire lives in this dead religious system. It was all that they knew. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, we're not doing that anymore. Now again, we look back and we're like, well, yeah, that was a great time in history. But if you were someone that had grown up for some 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years in that religious society, and someone comes up to you and says, you're not worshiping in that way anymore, what would your comment be? You'd probably be a little put off, right? Like, uh, excuse me, this is how we do it, right? Excuse me, this is how we worship God. Don't you understand that? So Jesus is coming on the scene, and he's not only disrupting the old covenant and the religious way of being the dead religion, but he's literally disrupting people's lives and saying there is a better way to live. There is a relational way with God to live. No longer are you separated from God, but you will be united with God. No longer will you have to sacrifice, because I will become the ultimate sacrifice. No longer will you have to go to priests or scribes or Pharisees, religious leaders, because I will be your high priest and we will be in relationship. We will be interacting. And it changed the course of history. Just like the cassette players and the hand crank egg beaters and the hand crank pencil sharpeners, Hebrews 6 or Hebrews 8, 6 tells us this. The ministry Jesus had received is superior to theirs as a covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one since the new covenant is established on a better promise do you see the new thing coming on the scene the new covenant and hebrews 8 6 says it is what it is superior it is better than the old one the old has been replaced the new is coming in and the goal of this message is not just to look back at this these verses in john 2 and understand them better but to walk in the abundance of God daily, that we would check our own lives, not be in religion or in legalism or in a tradition, but we would be in a real relationship with Jesus himself and have that abundant life that Jesus talks about. So our story in John 2, Jesus is the disruptor of dead religion. And I pray that he would disrupt our lives as well if we fall into dead religion. Let's read John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22 states this. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling ox and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords, and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away 
Stop making my father's house a place of business. Now, Tara shared so eloquently this morning in her sharing of the Bible reading that the house of God is a house of prayer, right? A house of worship, a house of prayer. What had they made it? They had made it a house of business. Verse 17. His disciples rem remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to Jesus, What sign do you show us for your authority for doing these things? So catch the picture of what's going on here. Jesus is getting personal. He's not just driving out the animals and shooing them away, opening the cages, letting the doves go free, not just turning over the tables, but he's grabbing the people's money and dumping it out. And the Jews come up to him, and this says it very politely. It says, they say, what sign do you show us of your authority for doing these things? Well, really what's happening is this. They're going to, coming up saying, who are you to think, to think you can do something like this in our temple? I mean, the verse here puts it very nicely and pretty, but this is a confrontive thing. They're going like, what do you think you're doing? Who are you to be able to do this? Who are you to come into our city, our temple, our trade, and throw our stuff out? Verse 19, then Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And which temple is he talking about? His body, not the rock temple, his body. But they didn't get it. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. We'll stop there. Little side note, little rabbit trail. I think it's interesting that the disciples remembered that but it doesn't say that the religious leaders remembered that. Isn't that interesting? Because the disciples were looking for the Messiah. Who wasn't? The religious leaders. Because they were just having their ongoing control over the people. They weren't looking for the Messiah, but the disciples were. As we look at the Word of God, there's often, like Shrek would say, layers. You know, an onion has layers, parfaits have layers, right? There's layers to the Word of God as you dig in deeply. So the first layer is usually the obvious literal layer. layer. We were talking the other night with Tara and Justin about just reading the Word of God and digging in deeper. And when you read through the Gospels, you can just take them at face value for what they are, right? You don't need to have a theological degree. You don't need to have a huge education. You don't need to have some study in hermeneutics to understand the Gospels. You can read them at face value and they make sense, right? It's very clear. So the first level is just usually an obvious, literal level. That's the first layer. Second layer, if you can and will and choose to dig in deeper, there's a deeper meaning or interpretation that's not obvious at first. And then the third level as we read the Word of God is more personal. The third level as we read the Word of God is a personal application of how do I take what God is saying and I put it into practice in my own personal life. I take God's Word and I make it live and work and come out through me. So we're going to look at all three layers today as Jesus talks about what he did in the temple. So first layer. Jesus is, is disrupting the corruption in the temple. The scripture starts in verse 213 that it was almost time for the Passover. And so the history behind this, the setting is, in the Passover, hundreds, thousands of people would come to Jerusalem. Why? To come to the temple to worship, to honor God. And if you were traveling back then, you either went by foot, you went on donkey, or maybe you even had a carriage or something, but everything came with you, right? It was not paved roads, it was dirt, it was dusty. There were a few Roman roads that were covered in cobblestone, but traveling was an experience, right? I mean, just to go a few miles probably took you all day long because you had the kids, and, and if you were wealthy enough and could afford it, you brought animals, but if you brought animals, it was a multiple day trip. What else did you have to bring? Well, food and water and sustenance to get you there for both you and the animals. So coming to Jerusalem was a, a trip. It was an experience depending on how far you lived out. 
So the people are all coming into Jerusalem, and what that would do to Jerusalem, it's kind of like when Salt Lake hosts the Olympics, what it would do is there would be this massive economic boom, right? I mean, all the merchants in, in Jerusalem probably looked, over, looked out excitedly for the Passover time, right? I mean, they'd be stocking their shelves, they'd be making sure they had rooms, they had all this stuff, because as the people came in, they needed a place to stay, they needed a, a, a food to eat, they needed stuff to do, they wanted entertainment, right? So it was a financial economic boom for Jerusalem. And what had happened was in the temple, the religious leaders saw this also, and they chose to make it convenient for the people that you don't have to bring your own sacrifice. We'll provide it for you. You just have to what? buy it from us. So the religious leaders had this whole set of merchants set up right outside the temple and they had all the different sacrifices, you know, depending on how bad your sin had been in the last year or what you could afford. And you would buy your sacrifice to go and honor, to offer as a, a sacrifice in the temple. Now here's what the problem was. They were crooked. They were mischievous. They were not honest. Verse 2, 14 says, In the temple courts, Jesus found the people selling cattle and sheep and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Notice this is in the temple courts, in the courtyards of the church. It's become a place of business. I mean, you could buy your turtle doves over here. You could buy your fatted lamb over here. You could buy your calf over here. You walked in, and before you came into the synagogue, into the place of offering, there were shops set up all over the place. This was a mini mall, in essence. It was no longer a church. It was a place of business. So the worshipers would come in, and they would leave their sacrifices at home because they knew they could purchase them at the temple. And when they exchanged them, the first thing they would do is they would overcharge them for the animals which put the people in a bind because they came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to God, so they needed a sacrifice. And now they get there, and it's overpriced. They know it's overpriced, but what are, what's, what's the bind they're in? i got to have something. And I'm sure that the religious leaders made sure that they had their lock and key on the choicest animals because you don't want to offer an unblemished animal. So they probably told other people, well, the people outside of the temple, well, they have unblemished animals. You don't want to sacrifice those animals, so you better buy the premium here. You better upgrade. So they overcharged them for the animals for the sacrifices. And then the second thing that they did was when they exchanged the money, maybe had Greek money or Roman money or Jewish money or whatever, when they exchanged the money, they charged a little extra interest for the exchange rate, right? So they're completely taking advantage of the people. Now that's no different than today. I mean, if you go to a concert and you buy a sweatshirt, let's say you're a Swifty like Ken is. <laughs> he loves Taylor Swift and he spends $1,000 to go to where she's playing her concert. He spends $2,000 to go to the concert and get the VIP tickets. And then as he's leaving, he wants a souvenir. So he wants to buy a Swifty sweatshirt. Well, I can go to Kohl's and probably find one and buy one for maybe 20, 30 bucks. What's he gonna pay at the concert? Probably way more than 50, right? Probably more around 90 or 100 for the same one he could buy here for 20 or 30. Because they've got a captive audience. And they're taking advantage of him because he's caught up emotionally in the moment. And they're like, you want the sweatshirt? Come on, cough it up, buddy. Cough it up. That's what's going on here. Coming in, the house of worship, the house of prayer. And now it's a mini mall and they're taking advantage of the people. They're like, you want to sacrifice to God? You want to get rid of your sins? Cough up the money. Come on now. In fact, in Mark eleven sixteen, the animals and what is going on is referred to as merchandise. The house of God, the place of worship, the place of prayer has become a place of merchandise. 
So what does Jesus do? Not Jesus meek and mild, but Jesus who? Jesus the disruptor. John 2 verse 15, he made a whip out of cords and he drove all of them out of the temple courts. He walks into the little mini mall in front of the, the place of offering. He's got his whip and he just starts banging things around, throwing over tables, dumping out money, opening the cages, unhooking the cattle and the oxen and the, the sheep and driving them out. Jesus is coming in, and I can kind of picture, I don't know if this happened or not, but I'm sure he's coming and going, just get out. This is my father's house. Get out. You are corrupting it. You're making a place of business. And it's a scene. It's a scene. In fact, Jesus says in John 2, 16, he says, stop turning my father's house into a marketplace of business. Now I struggle with this in modern society, in modern times, because a lot of churches have coffee shops and bookstores, which aren't in themselves bad. But I think of this, and I think of those churches, which they're doing it with good intention, but I wonder if that's the right thing to do in a church. Because then it becomes a place of business not necessarily a place of worship. And when a church becomes a place of business instead of a place of ministry, there is a serious problem, isn't there? There's a serious problem. Jesus is disrupting the corruption and the financial exploitation that the religious leaders are holding over the people. You see, the Bible tells us that God is a jealous God. He is jealous for his people, and he is zealous for his father's house, right? In other words, he doesn't want his father's house to be profaned, and he is jealous for those who belong to him, meaning us. So when others come in and try and take advantage of us or wound or hurt us, Jesus takes it personally, doesn't he? And it bothers him. Here's a couple verses to show you that. Proverbs 11.1 1 says, the Lord detests dishonest scales, but accurate weights find favor with him. The Lord detests dishonest scales. What was going on here in the temple courts? They upcharged for the animals, they charged a higher price, and when they exchanged money, was it a fair exchange? Nope. There's a little add-on for the exchange rate. Proverbs 16:11. Honest scales and balances belong to the Lord. And the reverse of that would be, dishonest scales would belong to who? The devil, the deceitful, the liars, the corrupt. Matthew 7, 12 says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law of the prophet. So first layer of our story is really simple. Jesus, the disruptor, is coming into the temple and driving them out and demanding not just asking, but demanding that they stop making his father's house a place of business. He's saying this is a place of worship. This is a place of prayer. This is a place of healing, a place of sanctuary. This is a holy place. And you're making it a mini mall. First layer is obvious. Second layer, Jesus is disrupting the system of death and sacrifice. Jesus' actions are actually prophetic because they foretell that Jesus will do this. And when he does this, he is signaling the end of the mechanical religious system that's going on right now. He's signaling the end of the need for sacrifices because we don't need a religion based on sacrifices because Jesus, in a week, is about to become what? The final sacrifice. And then he overcomes death and he raises from the dead three days later, just like he tells religious leaders, and he overcomes the old system. Why did the people sacrifice on a regular basis? Why did they come to Jerusalem every year to sacrifice? Because just like in Genesis, when the animal was killed for its skin to cover Adam and Eve after they sinned, the sacrifice only covered the sin for a short while, didn't it? It was temporary. It only lasted for a little bit, and then there had to be more atonement. 
Jesus comes in to disrupt that system and say there's no longer a need for a blood sacrifice because as he's sacrificed on the cross as the final, ultimate Lamb of God, he takes the place of that position. And as we read on, we'll actually see that Jesus says he prefers something in his Father's house and our lives over worship. Do you know what he prefers? He says, I deserve mercy over sacrifice. We'll get to that in just a little bit. When you read through the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament Gospels, you realize that God is asking for mercy more than sacrifice. At this time, the people sacrificed. It was near and dear to them because they did it all their lives. This is how they got rid of their sins. This is how they cleansed themselves for another year as they went to the Passover and they bought these animals and they blood sacrificed them to the priest and that would cover them. But then they'd have to do it again next year. And then again, you think of all the 600 laws to protect the Ten Commandments and all that they had to keep and do and, and be deemed righteous. And I look back and I think of these people and I think that must have just been a mind mess. Constant stress and struggle, right? Because you're constantly having to do these things to not break the laws, to not be unholy, to give the sacrifice to cover your sins for a short while and do it again. It was in essence a system of works, wasn't it? You had to keep doing stuff to appease God. You had to keep doing it over and over again because what you did was never enough. And I don't know if you ever lived a life like that or had a job like that where all that you do is never what? Enough. They need more of you, more of your time, more of your effort, more of your energy. They need more. And when you give them more, what do they do? Do they say, hey, thank you very much. We sure appreciate you giving more. No, what do they do? We want more. In essence, that's the lives these people lived in. And their service to God. Constantly giving, constantly doing. And Jesus comes in and says, this is enough. This system is now obsolete. I'm going to become the final sacrifice. I will cover your sins. And it will be a one and done type deal. You will have grace and mercy now, you don't deserve it. It's not fair. It's not fair that I have to die for your sins and you receive my grace from your sin. But that's how it's going to be. That's why Jesus says, and the Old Testament says, that God desires, desires mercy more than sacrifice. Because sacrifice is that giving, and often that's given out of shame and guilt or trying to appease God, right? There are times it's given in true abundance and joy, which is fantastic. We love you to do that. But oftentimes it's done out of a works mentality to try and make God happy. And Jesus says, no, it's about mercy. Can you imagine hearing that? If you were someone at this time coming into Jerusalem for the Passover, to hear that you don't need to sacrifice again and again and again and again. You don't need to keep all these 600 and some odd laws. You just need to trust in the Messiah and receive his grace and his mercy and his love and you're good. What would that sound like to these people who had lived under the burden of law all their lives? The burden of having to do more and more and more. Jesus comes and says, no, that is gone. We have a new covenant, a better covenant, a more fulfilling covenant. Why do we need to understand why that was so impactful to them back then? Because we need to realize it too now. Because we have received that same covenant and sometimes we fall into the same system of doing, doing, doing because we think we need to, we have to, we should. And God's going, I freed you from all that. I gave you mercy. You too are now free. That's why that's so important, to have that mercy. Jesus was acting prophetically and he was casting out the old system like the way of the pager and the phone booth. It was now, what? Obsolete. Obsolete. Something new and better 
had come and it was time to put the old away and embrace the new. Kind of sounds like the salvation message, doesn't it? Leave the old dead stuff away and become a new creation. Wow, that's thematic through the Bible, isn't it? Isn't that cool? That's what's happening here. Deuteronomy 6.5 says this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That's what Jesus was saying we now need to do. Love the Lord your God with everything that you are. That's what's important. Make God number one. Not the rules, not the regulations, not the have-tos, not the, to feel guilty about, not the shaming, but love God with all your heart. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11. It says, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and of the fatted, catted, fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Now this is Old Testament stuff. This is even before Jesus with the Passover. God's saying, I don't need that sacrifice from you. Going back to Deuteronomy that's grounded in love, God's saying, I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength. Hosea 6.6 6 says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. And finally, we hear that again in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, as Matthew repeats Hosea 6.6, 6, and he says, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Or it's actually Jesus is saying this, not Matthew. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Mark 12, verse 32 to 34 says this, as Jesus is speaking to the people. He says, well said, teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to the man, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Do you hear some repetition here between Old Testament and New Testament? Love the Lord your God with everything you got. Acknowledge God that he is number one. And have that mercy instead of sacrifices. God says, I don't need the burnt offerings. I got enough animals. I've had enough of the Old Testament. I have a new covenant now, which brought forth the end of the sacrificial system. And I want you to realize that in this day and time, this was radical. This was totally radical. Why? because it's what they had done for what? Generations, decades, hundreds of years. This was radical. To put it in modern understanding, let's say this. Let's say a prophet came into the United States and said, okay folks, I'm speaking to all the Christians. No more church building. Sell them, tear them down, get rid of them. From now on, you're meeting in people's homes. You're meeting in parks. You're meeting in open spaces. You're coming together out in public to praise me and to worship me and to, to grab hands and pray. He goes, I want, I want the world to see the church out in the open, in the open scenes. Get rid of the buildings. Well, would that rattle some feathers today? Absolutely. Because we kind of see the church as the place we meet and the place we meet as a building and that's what's important, right? If the building collapses, does the church still go on? Oh, I better, right? Because the church is not what? Building, no matter how pretty it is, how much stained glass we have and gold polished offering trays, the church is the people of God, the men and women of God, those who have salvation in Jesus by grace alone. So if a prophet came into the United States and said, okay, sell the buildings, get rid of the churches, take all the money, feed the poor, meet the needs, and you, the people of God, go to the park and gather in hordes in public and sing praises and pray and worship and let the world see you. Wow. Would that have an impact on our nation? Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's what's happening here. And of course, we all know from our point of view, Jesus became that final sacrifice, right? We see at the beginning of the Passover thing, he's coming in, the triumphal entry, he takes out the money changers, and then a week later, basically, he is crucified. He is sacrificed on the cross. The last sacrifice that a believer of God ever needed to have. No more turtle doves, no more fattened calf, no more lambs, no more any of that. Because Jesus became the final sacrifice. In fact, Jesus put the final nail in the coffin of religion when he was crucified, buried, and rose from the grave. That system died. It was gone. Third layer, last one. Practical application time. Are you ready? It's a good thing this is Ken's favorite part. He's like, bring it, come on. How does the first and second layer impact your life? That's the question we've got to ask, right? Jesus is destroying the old system. He's getting rid of the pagers, the phone booths, the, the, the cassette players. They're obsolete. He's bringing in something new. How does that impact us? How does the second layer of the mechanical religious system and the sacrifices and Jesus desiring mercy more impact us? Well, it impacts us in a very good but sometimes confrontive way. We need to be open to allow God, to allow Jesus to do what to our lives? Disrupt our lives. And at first, when you hear that Jesus is going to disrupt your life, what does that do? Kind of brings a little fear, doesn't it? <laughs> hey, I, hey, I don't want that. I'm pretty happy the way I am. But we've got to realize in salvation, Jesus radically disrupted our lives because we were in a life of sin and selfishness and, and being our own God and, and being in the grips of Satan. And when we accepted the call of God and repented before God and accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior by grace and grace alone, God disrupted our lives and made us say, what? A new creation. Behold, the old has passed away. You are now a new creation. And we think, that's really cool. But then as we grow along in maturity, or sometimes we don't, we need God to do what to our lives? To disrupt us. And here's the thing, God always disrupts us in love. Do you notice that back in the, the stories of Jesus cleansing the temple? Do you read anywhere in there? Now, the animal rights people are going to love this, right? Pete is going to love this. Did he damage any of the animals? Did he kill any of the animals? No, he just set them free. He didn't have any righteous anger for the animals. They were innocents, right? He just set them free. He was angered at the religious system and the people that were taking advantage of the people and making it a place of business. We look in the New Testament and we see where Jesus, there were God disrupts the lives of people over and over, but he always does it in love, and he always does it for their benefit. We read in John 4, verses 5 to 30, there was this woman at the well out in the middle of the day, which means she was what? An outcast. She was not accepted by others. And she and Jesus had a conversation which shouldn't have taken place because she was a Samaritan, a half-breed, and Jesus was a Jew, a full blood, right? That conversation never should have taken place but Jesus went to her. Did he bash her for what she was doing? For having five husbands? For being an outcast in her own town? Even as a Samaritan, she was an outcast Samaritan from the outcast Samaritans? That's pretty bad. Did Jesus bash her? No. He disrupted her life in love. And what did it do? It changed her life for good. To the point she ran back into the city and proclaimed what? You have got to come and see the man who told me my entire life story. You've got to see him. He is the Messiah. And when Jesus comes in, they hear for themselves. We know the story because we've looked at it many times. They don't want him to leave, right? It's like Jesus had to stay there several days because Jesus disrupted the life of one woman who had made bad choices. Jesus didn't convict her of those bad choices radically changed her. Was she sad that Jesus disrupted her life? Well, not if she's going back to the town and saying, hey, you guys gotta come check this guy out. 
John 7, verses 50, John 7, 53 to chapter 8, verse 11. The religious leaders, once again, in their mechanical system, bring a woman who's caught in adultery. Now, what's missing here? The man. Usually, adultery takes two people, right? Amazingly, the man isn't there. Hmm. Think it was a setup? I totally do. And they're looking at Jesus. They've got their rocks, and they're like, Lord, the law says you commit adultery, we should kill you by stoning. Well, that was the law. Yeah, that's what was required by the law. But what was Jesus bringing in? A new covenant. What was Jesus doing in people's lives? Disrupting them. How? In love. And Jesus goes down and starts drying in the sand. And he disrupts the life, the life of that woman. And he disrupts the life of those religious leaders with their pharisaical, their law and regulation beliefs. And when it's all said and done, what do the religious leaders do? You know the story. One by one, they what? Put down the rock and they walk away. And what does the woman do? As Jesus disrupts her life, he picks her up from the ground and he says, woman, where are your accusers? And she's like, they're gone. And he's like, well, I accuse you neither. Go and sin no more. Then we see in Acts chapter 9, Saul, who out of sincerity and desire to please God was torturing Christians and killing them, imprisoning them. In his mind, he had good intentions. And on that road, Jesus disrupts the life of Paul. Do you think Paul ever regretted that? I don't. Because Paul became the greatest missionary for Christ that the church has known. The greatest evangelist. To go from one who sought to kill Christians to now being a man who proclaimed Jesus is the one true living God. Do you see how when God disrupts the lives of people he does it in love and they benefit from it? And then they all walk away proclaiming the goodness of God. And they all walk away in freedom. No condemnation, no conviction, but freedom. When God disrupts your life and my life, he does it in love and mercy, not violence. There are pastors that use this section in John chapter 2 as a way to say, we can have a righteous anger, but that's not the point of this gospel, is it? The point is to keep God's church and God's people holy, a people of prayer, a people of worship, a people of mercy, of love. It's not about anger. It's about freedom. So the final deal here is this. It's simple. Practical application is what? Let God disrupt your life embrace it and actually in a weird Christian way because we Christians are weird we do things in different ways look forward to God disrupting your life because the consequence is freedom and is love and encouragement to be courageous for him Ephesians 4 11 to 12 our last verse of the day it says, so Christ gave himself, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists, and pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Not held in bondage, not held in fear, not held captive, but built up. The word to equip in the Greek language is katartismon, and it means a proper or exact adjustment. And the literal meaning is this, it's a medical term. It means to reset a broken bone in a right way. So when God gives us all these blessed people to minister to us, when God disrupts our lives, it's like that we have something that's broken, right? We have a broken arm. And when God disrupts our lives, he resets that in a proper way. He equips us to be right again and makes us whole and heals us. And isn't that a good thing? So this morning, as we come into Palm Sunday and Easter, I want to introduce you to Jesus the Disruptor. And as Jesus the Disruptor enters your life, 
I want you to open the door of your heart and welcome him with open arms and say, Lord, here I am, let's do this. Because it's going to bring you freedom. It's going to break away the chains and the shackles and the guilt. It's going to break the legalism out of your life. It's going to break the need to sacrifice to appease God so you don't have his wrathful anger upon you. And you're going to come out with love, peace, and hope, and courage, and freedom, and joy, and abundance. You're going to be talking about Jesus all the time because of what this man did. When others accused you, this man gave you freedom and loved you. Let Jesus the disruptor disrupt your life today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you. We thank you for your message, for your word that is so practical, it's so impactful. We thank that you fought that battle, that war to get rid of the old, the obsolete, the, the legalism, the religion, the need to appease a God, to avoid, to avoid his anger. We thank you, Lord, that you have come to us and given us love and peace and mercy, that you meet us where we're at, and you embrace us, and you forgive us. Lord, disrupt our lives today, that we may proclaim the goodness of God to all nations and all people, that they too might receive your disruption. In Jesus' name.